All right. This morning we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 4. Basically, if you was to uh, pick up in chapter 2, Paul really starts dealing with the ministry and writing to the church specifically because this is to the church at Corinth. And so he's dealing with the ministry in context from chapter 2, mainly in, uh, starting in verse 14, on through the end of this chapter. So in part of chapter 3, he gets down and takes, matter of fact, we'll just, we'll just look at that and pick it up from there. But in verse number 13, as he's talking about <coughs> the glorious and spiritual side of the ministry, he, he deals with the Old Testament example here of Moses and says in verse 13, And not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now, there's a lot in that verse right there. Uh, we never think about that. When we think about Moses coming down after those 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain and having that veil over his face so they looked on him but they couldn't look on him because his face glowed with the glory of God what Paul is saying is we as the church and where we are now have a more glorious unveiling if you will they couldn't see the end that's why he said uh, the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished they couldn't see the end of the law. That was the start of the law. That was the beginning. They couldn't see the end. Now look at verse 14. But their minds were blinded for until... Now notice there, it, uh, there it says, For until the day, until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away, and the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So he is saying to the Jews that as they still are living, a lot of them, and reading the Old Testament, keeping the Old Testament laws, that the veil is still on. They don't realize uh, that the veil is taken away and done away with in Christ. And that's what it said in verse 15. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Then he goes on and talks about uh, how that we look through a glass dimly and one day we're going to look face to face and he picks up in chapter 4 here, and verse number 1 says, Therefore, now what is the therefore, therefore? You've got to go back. That's why I want to go back and read uh, the context of where we are coming from uh, in this chapter here. So, taking everything into consideration that you have read before, basically, seeing we have this ministry. Now, first of all, uh, we've got to understand that each and every one of us have a ministry. Now, yours is different than mine. Uh, you know, some people play in the band. Some people keep nursery. Other people do up send cards. But I want to tell you, you as a child of God, whether you realize it or not, you are a minister. He's writing to this church. He says, concretely, we have this ministry. It's of the utmost importance that you see your involvement in this church or your church as a ministry. Whatever it is, you got to see the importance of that. You and I will be accountable before our holy God for how we handle the affairs that God has placed in our hands. This ministry, the one that God has given you, whether you think it's significant or not, you are placed in the ministry here at Faith Baptist, even if it's in this Sunday school class. Whatever it is, everybody in here takes place in the part of this ministry. And we will be accountable before God. Then he says, uh, he says, in this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So to the depth that we have received mercy. Now how can you measure the mercy that God has bestowed upon each and every one of us. Well, we can't measure that. We can't measure the depth of the mercy that God has, but it's in that depth that we faint not. We continue to go on no matter what comes our way. We're to continue to be steadfast in the ministry that God has for us. Now, a lot of people will take 
this passage of the scripture in these contexts and think, well, sure, that's for the Sunday school teacher, that's for the deacon, that's for the choir director, that's for the pastor, that's for the staff, that's got nothing to do with me. I don't say, brothers and sisters, you're in here. <laughs> this is you. You are identified with Christ. And so your identity with Christ and His blood upon you and His sealing upon you identifies you with this ministry. This is a broad brush, if you will, that the Spirit of God is painting with here. And of course, it is individual, each and every one. So we have a ministry in verse number one. Now in verse number two, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's a power-packed verse right there in itself. We must operate, we must function our ministry up front and honestly. Don't try to trick the people. When you involve the people in a ministry, just be honest and real. That's all you got to do. Uh, whatever comes of a ministry down the road, I don't care what it is, whatever vision comes out, people will buy into it more, get involved with it more. Well, there's no trickery, there's no craftiness, everybody just knows exactly where we're at. And that's what we have to do. And the Bible here says we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. That means we're just not going to partake of any dishonesty. Now, what does the scripture say? Paul said you cannot do nothing for the truth or against the truth, but for the truth. The truth doesn't change. And I know you heard me say that and beat that horse to death before, but the truth doesn't change. So we need to be operating in the truth. Renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Don't use the word of God the second part there. He says, not walking in craftiness, that's in deceitfulness. That's what the devil does. No handling the word of God deceitfully. So we're not to use the word of God for a snare or for corruption. And that's what craftiness means. It's like a trap that's set out. I've seen it done many times, and you have too, in the past. Uh, uh, people uh, will take the, the pl platform they have in the ministry and absolutely deceive people. I don't know how much you've watched your uh, news, but it happens all the time. I, I mean, treasurers of the church will take their position of money coming in and work the numbers and cook the books and make stuff disappear. Well, you ain't doing that and getting away with it before God. Uh, I, I told you the story of not too long ago in a, a little church in Calvary County. I mean, $100,000 got missing over a two-year period. How do you do that? Well, you, the wrong one in position. <laughs> and it got the corruption got to going. The flesh got to operate. Man, and it happens in businesses. It happens everywhere. And it can even happen to a believer. Don't think it can't happen. Just because you're a child of God, don't think your flesh can't overtake you and the temptation overtake you and start <coughs> having that. Now, when we have that good conscience and know that we got to stand before God, that helps. To not let nothing like that happen. And so Paul is saying, we just going to be clean. We're going to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not going to walk in any kind of corruption and deceitfulness. Nor are we going to handle the word of God deceitfully. He said, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So the truth being uh, whatever is you're talking about. Let me just put this on here. I, this will give you a, uh, a, a good a definition of the truth. So if we go to the Greek here, 
Now, now look at this. Now, what is true in any matter under consideration? No matter what it is, people want the truth. It can be a decision you person to make about money in the ministry. It can be a decision about anything. But whatever it is, the Bible says what is true in any matter under consideration. So that, that just doesn't matter exactly what it is. It's that we need to do the truth. Now i got to get it back on the right one. Maybe we can get it. Hey, there it is. I got used to using my phone and not this big tablet. It's going to take me a little bit. But the truth in any matter. And then he goes on in verse number 3 through 5. We must preach Christ and not ourselves. Let me just back up because I missed a couple of my notes here on the conscience. What is the conscience in the Word of God? It's the soul as distinguishing. You know, your soul of man, the heart of man, is what we think and how we function and what moves us. Well, uh, God, we're made in the image of God, so God made us that way. God works through a man's conscience. And it's your conscience at night when you've done wrong to somebody and you wrong them, it's your conscience at night that's bothering you. And that's the way God has designed us. And people can uh, just sort of just cover that up and cover that up and cover that up and sweep it under the rug. But I'm going to tell you, if you're a child of God, a sweet Holy Ghost, is just he's going to knock on your heart's door. He's going to say, listen, don't you even try to bring your gift to the altar. That's what he said, what Jesus said. He said, if ye have all within it, don't bring your, before you bring your gift to the altar, you leave it at the altar. You go find that brother and you make it right, then come and offer your gift to me. So God has a way of cleaning up. And I thank God for that purification that he does. So the conscience is the distinguishing between what is morally good and what is bad. The prompting to do the former and shun the latter. And then commending here means commending the one and shunning the other. Commending what's right and shunning the other. In the conscience, there's several scriptures in, in Titus 1.15. Let me put it up here on the screen. And let's see. Scroll up to it. Under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And also in 1 Timothy uh, in 4, in verse number 2, speaking <coughs> lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. A lot of people don't, they start out, especially as kids, a lot of parents are trained them to do right and to be right. And as they get older and, and they realize that maybe they can tell a little lie and get by with it, you know. And then it starts and it starts and it starts. Next thing you know, as they get on up into life, it's nothing to them to lie. I know some. Uh, I just know some people that as soon sit there and lie to your face <laughs> as tell you the truth. Yeah. Right. And just like you're stupid enough not to know the difference. <laughs> I, I mean, it, oh boy, they ain't gonna even get into all that. But I, I'm here to tell you, there's people like that. How did it start out? How did it get that way? By being deceitful yeah. and not being honest. The next thing you know, they're living that lifestyle. And they begin to believe the lie. And that all falls into the devil's trap. What? Who is the father of all lies? The devil. Who is the father of all deceitfulness? The devil. So that just played right into his part. Now, in verse number 3 and through uh, 6, we must preach Christ and not ourselves. Notice this now. But if our gospel be hid, now what has he just been talking about? He's just been talking about hiding things, deceitful things, and, and covering things over, and handling stuff, and doing all that. So he said, listen, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, see, the devil, 
has blind, notice that is a little G also, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He is the image. What did Paul say in the book of Colossians? I think it's chapter 1 and around verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn among every creature. So Jesus Christ is the image. And if their minds are blinded, it's blinded because of their started with their conscience. It started adding all these things up and they started being the little lies led to big lies and the little deceit led to big deceit. And now all of a sudden, they ain't even got a conscience of God in them. It's sin with a hot iron like we saw a while ago and read in the Word of God. It's like their conscience, like you just took a wound and you seared it and covered it over, like it's branded, if you will. By the way, that's the same sear. It does mean branded, just like people brand cattle and different things like that. But their minds are blinded, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now notice this. Now we preach not ourselves. That's very critical. <laughs> We preach not ourselves. You don't have to go out and talk about yourself all the time. Now, you do have a testimony, and you do have experiences that you experience in life, and you need to use them in witnessing and sharing the gospel. But be careful that everything, especially your prayer life, is not all about you. Be very careful. I can hear people all the time, and it, it tickles me a little bit. I, I, I just uh, I just put it as they need to grow a little bit. But I, I, it tickles me to hear people pray, and it's just all about them. <laughs> all the time, God, would you do this for me, you know, and Lord, help me, and all this, me, me, me. Well, we need to be concerned with others, and need to put God first. And then there is a, uh, there is a good rule, and I know I've shared it with you, but, you know, the hand is a good illustration to pray with you. Praise God, we thank God, we confess our sins, we intercede, and then we petition, and then we listen. That's a good rule of thumb, or a good rule of the hand, if you will, on that. But preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants for Jesus' sake. You see, all we ask, and all God asks, and is for us to be a servant. That's what Jesus did. What an example we had. He was a servant to all. Then he noticed this. Now, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, the third thing is that in the ministry, we're not to preach ourselves. Now, in verse number 7, if our ministry will line up in this order God has laid out in His Word here, then His power will be on our ministry and not ours. Then God can and will perform His work in our ministry. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What a treasure we have. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So what, what treasure is He talking about? What we just read, we got the light. And we'll, we'll uh, walk rightly and honestly and do what's right and the light will shine in us and we have that treasure of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So if all that lines up, we can be affected. Now in verse number 8 and through the rest of this little chapter here, we got to understand that suffering <coughs> is a part of life and ministry or I should say part of the life of the ministry. Don't think if God calls you into the ministry or part of your ministry now that you're doing that sometimes you're not going to suffer. Don't ever think and don't ever get into the war with me. And it's easy to do for everybody. Because, you know, especially us guys, we can handle stuff for a while. But after a while... The wilds weigh in on us. 
I mean, it's just one leg after another leg after another leg, another situation, another situation, another situation. And you're trying to weigh it all in and carry it. And when we get to the end of ourselves and we lay it out there and say, God, it's yours, I am done. Then, guess what? That's when he starts working. But it's hard for us to get there. But don't think because you are a child of God that you're not going to suffer. Now, I, I understand and know that the, most of the stuff we're fixing to read here that Paul wrote is the very same stuff he did before he got saved. He used to beat people. He used to kill people. He sat there and watched Stephen get stoned uh, and saw him uh, pray to God in heaven about forgive them for they know not what they do. He cast people into prison. Families in the prison tore them apart for the gospel. Guess where he spent most of his ministry? In prison. So he reaped what he sold even though he was forgiven. There's still a price that has to be paid for sin. You can be forgiven. The jail is full of people right now who have been forgiven for what they've done, but there's still a penalty to be paid for the sin that they've done. So notice this now. We're in trouble on every side. <laughs> and I don't care if you, you break that down as north, south, east, and west. I don't care. <laughs> but everywhere, there can be trouble. We're in trouble on every side. Notice this now. Yet not distressed. You know what the distress signal is? It's when you're going under. And you have to throw up for a lifeline. But if we'll keep these things in order we just looked at that God laid out, even though we're troubled on every side, we're not going under. You see, every generation has their trials and things they go through. I, I remember when the economy, you know, it didn't affect everybody, but it affected a whole lot of people in a whole lot of ways. And... I had to, in my mind, know, number one, that God was going to supply. As long as I stay faithful and done what I'm supposed to do, God's going to do what He does. He's going to be faithful. But I had to know that, okay, this is my lot. This is my lot. This is where I'm at. This is the, this is the hand that's been dealt with me. And through God, and then slip up on God, and He knows it. So don't throw in the towel. Don't give up, no matter how hard it gets, because there is another side. Well, I heard the pastor's famous, uh, one of these preachers say his favorite, they asked him what was his favorite scripture, and it came to pass. <laughs> I said, that will preach right there. No matter what it, look, no matter what it is, it will come to pass. One day it's coming to pass. I'm so glad we're going to lay us all down one day. We ain't going to have to worry about it. We ain't going to have to carry another burden. Joseph, we ain't going to have to milk another cow. Mm -hmm. Amen. We ain't going to have to, you know, get fuel that's outrageous one of these days. That just everything. We get hit on every side. I don't care. You can start. To go to, you know, the grocery store is going to be done away with. Hallelujah. You ain't got to go spend $200 a week on groceries for a family. Because uh, you can do that real quick. So everything, just it's going to be done away with. We're troubled on every side. We would agree we are troubled on every side. We can walk through it and walk on the mountaintop. But in the ministry, brother, you are troubled on every side. And we are a part of the ministry. He said, we are. Notice this. this. Again, notice. We are. It's going to happen. It's happening. But we are troubled on every side and yet not distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken. We are cast down but not destroyed. I tell you, but not ought to be good. Y'all just go out of here and just say, but not. <laughs> that's, that's a change, ain't it? Yeah. Somebody says something, but not. 
<laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Why? That the life also of Jesus might be uh, made manifest in our body. Now notice this, Paul said, For we which live are always <laughs> delivered unto death. For Jesus' sake, we must die daily. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Notice, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. Paul said the only way I can give you life is for me to die. You get it? And the only way that God can give us a life is for us to die. <coughs> every day. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Die to yourself every day and let God live through you. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then he says, we, I like this unity here, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore we speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound unto the glory of God. And so for which this cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You know, ain't it good that although we wake up, we might have to take us three or four Advil or something. Some of y'all ain't got there yet. <laughs> but some of us, we got to get up and we got to take something to kind of get the joints all loosened up. <laughs> get going, you know, get the back loosened up and all that good stuff for another day. But you know what? We can get up every day and our, our inward man, as we feed us the inward man, the Word of God, it's just getting stronger. He's getting stronger. The inside man is fresh. It never aches. I'm talking about the inside man, the spiritual man. I, and a lot of us, you know, we ain't talking the, the six packs, you know. We got six rolls when we sit down. You know what I'm saying? In our gut. We talked the six rows, but our inward man can be that <coughs> stout man. Our inward man can be the fit man. And it's new every day, and that's what he's talking about. He said, though this outward man is dying and perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Notice it's every day. For our light affliction, I like it. What light affliction, man? Everything he just talked about. Which is but for a moment. Worketh, I like it too, it's for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, you see our outlook will determine our outcome. We look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That'll help you and I if we will realize that what we're spending our life doing is a lot just going to be temporary. And yeah, we got to lay up treasures. we got to do all that stuff. But the, everything you look at out here is perishing just like the outward man. That's right. But everything on the inside, everything you laying up, everything you doing for the ministry is renewed every day. It's just brand new. Just like the Word of God. His mercies are new every morning. Golly, there's something about the morning. I can't explain. I'm just a morning person. I guess some of you may be some night owls and you you spend time with God at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. The Lord bless you. <laughs> I like getting out here and the birds waking up. Getting out early in the morning. Amen. And spending that time with God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for this day you give us. Lord, help us to worship you in this worship hour in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name.